Hi, welcome to the analysis.news. I'm Paul Jay, and we'll be back in just a few seconds with Matt Corda to further analyze, discuss the film Oppenheimer. Please don't forget, we, we only are able to keep doing this because of all of you who have donated. And But if you're somebody who's watching regularly and haven't donated, you can go over to the website and donate. So last week, I published an interview with Peter Kuznick, the historian. We discussed Oppenheimer, the movie, and we discussed a few things that we thought were flawed in the movie, although it's an incredibly great piece of filmmaking, and uh, on the whole, a pretty good piece of history with some serious uh, errors or flaws. Uh, one of the most important, I guess, is while there's a little bit of discussion that the atomic bombing of Japan wasn't necessary militarily, uh, the preponderance of the arguments in the film uh, justify the bombing as having saved American and even Japanese lives. Um, and, and there's other critical issues uh, that could have been dealt with. Uh, we think better, and I suggest you watch the interview with Peter. Uh, but now we're going to talk a, a little bit more about what the, the Oppenheimer message was, certainly uh, after the war, uh, and what it means for today. And so now joining me is Matt Corda. He's a senior research fellow at the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists, where he co-authors the Nuclear Notebook, an authoritative open source estimate of global nuclear forces and trends. Matt's also an associate researcher with the Weapons of Mass Destruction Program, at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, CIPRI, and co-authors the nuclear weapons chapters for the annual CIPRI yearbook. I should also mention that Matt is going to be in our film, How to Stop a Nuclear War, based on Daniel Ellsberg's book, Doomsday Machine, and he's also consulting with us on the film. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Thanks so much, Paul. Excited to be here. So, first of all, what's your overall impression of the film, especially, you know, looking at it through the frame of the, the danger of today. Yeah. So, you know, uh, a great quote that I, I thought, um, really sort of summed up my, my feelings about the film came from a, an interview that I saw with, uh, with the historian Alex Wellerstein after the, after the film was released. And he basically said, you know, we we're living today in Oppenheimer's worst nightmare which I thought really, uh, really sort of characterizes very accurately the, the state of global nuclear forces today, right? So back in 1945, where, where you know, a lot of the, the film is taking place, you know, you're dealing with um, these weapons that are of a very different character than the ones today. Um, the, the doctrines around which they would be used are very different. But today, you know, the, the, there are really significant changes um, one of which being that the number of countries that have nuclear weapons uh, has grown, you know, substantially since the time of Oppenheimer. The number of weapons in the world has also grown quite significantly, and then the weapons themselves have become a lot more powerful. So today, you sort of wrap all of these things up, and you know, you position them in a time of pretty significant geopolitical tension, and you see that the kind of you know these the last scenes of the film where where Oppenheimer is sort of talking about, um, you know the 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 state of the world and you know you you see these images of the missiles flying and things like that like this is the world that we live in today and and that's the the really worrying thing. Uh, Oppenheimer supported the uh, atomic bombing of Japan, uh, and and even to some extent suppressed or kind of didn't push as much as he could have reports from his fellow scientists, some of his fellow scientists who really opposed dropping nuclear weapons on Japan. At the very least, they said you could drop it on some uninhabited island. But, but Oppenheimer said, well, if you do it, it's going to so terrify everyone, uh, it will lead to uh, some kind of rational uh, opening up of nuclear arms talks, uh, reduction, uh, and quite the opposite happened uh, certainly now uh the, but, but his, well, his, you say it's his nightmare what was his dream <laughs> that's a great question i you know he 
was certainly someone who was a supporter of, of I guess, international control over nuclear weapons, right? He, in the movie, they sort of talk about this a little bit where he, he mentions that, you know, he wants to make sort of the, the secrets of the atomic bomb more public, right? And there are these great letters um, because our, our organization is is founded very much, um, was founded by many of the same scientists who worked on the atomic bomb. And so there are these letters. So the, you mean the Ameri- Association of American Scientists? The the yeah. Federation of American Federation, Scientists. Yeah. yeah. So we, we used to be the Federation of Atomic Scientists. Um, and it was that's how it was founded and then became Federation of American Scientists. But there are these great letters from Oppenheimer um, talking about nuclear transparency back in the in the you know mid to late forties, where he's talking about how um, you know if we keep the secrets of nuclear power uh, locked up just for the United States to understand, um, you know it's it's only going to do a disservice and lead to an arms race. And so the you know he has these great um, these great documents that are incredibly relevant today, right? When we when we think about how all countries, right, including the United States, are taking very serious steps back in terms of transparency, right? Even um, we we just published a piece a few days ago about how the Biden administration um, uh, refused to declassify the number of nuclear weapons in the U.S. stockpile. That was something that the Obama administration used to do. Um, the Trump administration stopped it, and the Biden administration is also no longer continuing with it. Now, this is the this is the guy who ran as president, saying he would declare no first strike, and then changed it once he became president, and, and has refused to say no first strike. Yeah, right. Like this is the this is the situation that I think um, a lot of presidents get into, right? No matter what their their personal feelings are about nuclear weapons, they they get into office, and you know the they get in many ways like briefed to death, right? About um, you know what's feasible, what's not feasible from, I guess, a military standpoint, what the allies will and won't like. And then it's it just it becomes just easier to do nothing as opposed to making a, a significant change towards policy. And, you know, it, it is really unfortunate because we're seeing that, you know, in many ways, pretty much every nuclear armed country, but it's most disheartening in the United States, is taking very serious steps back when it comes to things like transparency and being publicly accountable with regards to their stockpiles. I don't think people understand how how the danger has increased as compared to decades ago. And to some extent, what Oppenheimer hoped for, uh, to some extent, limited extent, did happen. Uh, you know, Nixon and Brezhnev have a negotiate an anti ballistic missile treaty in 1972. Uh, Reagan and Gorbachev. Uh, even before that, Kennedy, the, 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 there were real negotiations that at least showed some rationality to limit nuclear weapons. But if I understand it correctly, we're, we're now living in a period where, where there's virtually no treaties that mean anything anymore and no negotiations. Yeah, that's completely right. The The last bilateral strategic nuclear armed uh, nuclear treaty right, that, that limits the number of weapons that countries are allowed to deploy um, that last treaty is called New Start. Uh, New Start is effectively dead. Right? Um, uh, Russia, under a very um, you know poor legal basis, announced that they would be suspending the treaty, which is is not really um, there isn't a provision for for a suspension in the treaty. As a result, the U.S. took reciprocal measures and also basically said that they're not going to be providing data to Russia anymore. So the treaty is effectively um, non-existent at the moment. Um, it doesn't really look like there's much of an opportunity to to resurrect that um, because uh, Russia from the U.S. standpoint is still in violation of the treaty. And so e- there really is not much ground um, between the two countries anymore to really be particularly interested in arms control. I think more, more broadly speaking, something that's quite frustrating is that we're seeing that um, Arms control is very much falling victim to what I think is happening in a lot of cases, which is like ultimate domestic, you know, politicization, right? Where um, arms control used to be something that could be supported by both sides of the aisle here in the United States. It was something that was supported. um, it, It was understood to be something that you could negotiate an arms control treaty with an adversary that you hated because it was very important to do so. Um, and it, and it, 
you know, tangibly reduce nuclear risks. But today what we're seeing is that, you know, there's this very emotional and, and knee jerk reaction to the idea of even talking to Russia or even talking to China. Right. Because, you know, these are these are the bad guys. Right. Quote unquote, the bad guys. Right. So um, it, it's very domestically uh, uh, quite difficult. And whenever you have politicians who say, you know, we should be engaging with Russia, engaging with China on things that would actually, you know, tangibly improve the the state of the nuclear order, um, very quickly you hear calls for saying, well, now is not the right time for that because China is, you know, doing X, Y and Russia, you know, has invaded Ukraine, which is true. But that being said, you still have to engage with these countries because otherwise you have a global arms race. So it's it's um it's frustrating to see that just generally speaking when you look in congress right now there are very few individual politicians who would really go on out on a limb to support arms control anymore I, and i think it's important cuz in mainstream media it it almost never gets talked about probably the most destabilizing thing in terms of the demise of nuclear treaties and proper negotiations was the abrogation in 2002 of the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. And I don't think most people understand that. The treaty was negotiated, if I understand correctly, in 72. And it was a real great achievement. At the height, you know, Vietnam War is raging. The Cold War is raging. And still, Nixon and Brezhnev make a rational deal because they know that if you any side gets it an effective anti-ballistic missile system, it so destabilizes this, the parity that the other side's going to think a first strike's coming and they're going to launch the first strike. And and what happened, it, it's really, it's an interesting history, just quickly, is that in 1990, Charles Krauthammer, the big, one of the fathers of the neoconservatives, he called for abrogating the treaty. And in the Project for New American Century, which was all these neocons that wound up being around Bush and Rumsfeld, uh, and Cheney, uh, the Project for New American Century document called Rearming America's Armed Forces, the number one proposal is abrogating the ABM treaty and uh, with this massive build out of a global ABM force. And after 9-11, what's one of the first things these guys do? Abrogate the ABM treaty. And why? Because mm. it's a damn money pit. How much does it cost to build an effective ABM system? It's how long is a piece of string. Any, whatever you can bloody get Congress to come up with, that's what it costs. It's a money pit. And we're now living in a period where the Americans are rebuilding a, a serious ABM system, I got to say, with the support of Canada. I mean, how dangerous is this piece of it? And, and, and how dangerous was the abrogation of that treaty? Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult at this point to ignore um, the very real uh, connection that exists between offensive systems and defensive systems, right? The defensive systems, it's hard to even call them defensive systems because as, as you mentioned, and, and what many Cold War realists understood during the Cold War was that de defensive systems in many ways support an offensive posture, right? Because it allows you, if you have a good enough defensive system, it allows you to engage in potentially a first strike knowing that you can sort of mop up the what's called the ragged second strike that comes back at you. And therefore, you know, you you increase your invulnerability. Right. So it's, these are very destabilizing systems when when deployed at at scale. Um, you know, when the abrogation of the treaty happened right in 2002, this was something that was done very much, you know, as, as you mentioned, there's certainly there's a financial component to this, but also for, you know, very emotional reasons at the time, right? You know, 9-11 had just happened and there was this idea that, you know, I think it was um, Rumsfeld at the time who said, deploying something is better than deploying nothing. And I, you know, I think many folks would suggest now that, that that's actually not true. Deploying nothing would have been, you know, much better than deploying something, especially since the system that was deployed, um, it was, it was such a poor system, right? Like it, it was just so much money was put into it um, and the test record is so is so terrible, right? So it's you, you run into this situation where um, at the time, right, you had uh, Russian diplomats and Chinese diplomats who engaged with the United States and said, 
if you are serious about deploying this or about um, deploying these systems, we are going to take steps to deploy offensive systems to circumvent your defensive systems, right? That's classic action reaction arms race dynamic. And the US, you know, at the time basically wasn't particularly interested in engaging with those viewpoints, um, you know, by virtue of the, the administration that it had at the time um, and what those priorities were. But, you know, we're seeing now, like 20 years later, what, what the result of that is, right? In, in 2018, Putin gave this speech, right, in, in March 2018. And it was, a, it was a big, it was very well covered in the media because at the time he introduced six new systems, right? These, these new, what, what a lot of folks in the media called exotic strategic systems, right? That were, it was these weird things, right? One was like a, this underwater nuclear torpedo. One was a nuclear powered cruise missile that can, you know, circumnavigate the globe. One was um, this laser, one, you've read all of these, Hi, these hypersonic, systems. Right? Hypersonic. A hypersonic glide vehicle, right? Five out of those six systems were specifically designed to circumvent missile defenses. And Putin said so during his speech like 20 times, right? So, and he said at the time, the US, you know, he mentioned the ABM treaty and he says, the US didn't listen to us then, so listen now, right? So you can see these sort of threads that go between, you know, 2002, the decision that was made and what we're seeing today. And certainly like, I'm not, you know, I, I don't defend Putin here, like, I, but but you can see that countries react to things all the time, right? So, so he, the, the deployment of those kinds of systems, I'm sure there are lots of other drivers for those because, you know, just as in the in the United States, there's financial drivers for these things. There's prestige drivers, right? Hypersonics are a big deal, you know, all, all these things. But it's impossible to ignore that there's there is at least some driver that relates to missile defense in some way, because it, that that is the public justification that he uses for deploying those systems. It's the exact same with China, right? China, you were also seeing is deploying ICBMs at scale, right? They're they're put they're very likely putting multiple warheads on those ICBMs, right? These are things that you do when you which up until recently they had decided had not been doing they had, had kept their forces nuclear forces relatively modest. Yes, and yep. now they're they're going to catch up. And and you know just like with Russia, right? There are a lot of reasons why China might choose to to do these kinds of things, and and I don't think. All of them are a reaction to the United States, but certainly, I think it's very hard to ignore that that there's a, they're looking around the world, seeing what other countries are doing with regards to their defensive systems, and saying, okay, we need to we need to build around that, because um, that's 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 the nature of the arms race. And if you're sitting in the American military industrial complex, which is exactly where the guys that wanted to abrogate the treaty in 2002 were, I mean, Cheney was Halliburton and everybody knows all this, the, the uh, deep contacts of the pe Rumsfeld and the people around Rumsfeld, Cheney and the military industrial complex. I mean, they must have been grinning ear to ear when they abrogated the treaty. But I, I would guess the same thing's true in the Russian military industrial complex and the Chinese military industrial complex. Yep. But the Americans go first. The Americans are the ones that are the far bigger threat of a first strike than the other way. And there's no evidence there's ever been a day where the Soviet Union or Russia ever planned a first strike against the United States. But we know there actually were plans by the United States to have a first strike. You know, that's a lot of that came out of Ellsberg's work, but other work as well. So how can they not respond? And, and how can money making not be one of the main driving forces on the American side, because if it made sense to have an ABM treaty in 72, why all of a sudden didn't it make sense in 2002? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, right? Because, you know, the, you know, the, in 2002, the, the stated response or the, the stated justification was to, was to be able to respond to what they called like rogue states, right? So specifically Iran and North Korea, right? And now, you know, Iran, you know, Iranian ICBM and, or, and uh, the concept of an Iranian nuclear armed ICBM, I think, is is nowhere on the horizon. Right. And, you know, anytime soon. And, and the American national security estimate I, and, I, and maybe 2003 or two, but right around that period, maybe four, was that there was no Iranian nuclear bomb program, certainly no evidence of one and certainly not enough evidence of one to abrogate the treaty. 
which was, was clearly done on a scale that had nothing to do with Iran anyway. And I think, you know, the, the, the problem that we often see is that it, it often feels like the, the multiple sides are talking past each other, right? So with regards to the U.S., what they often say when they, when they try and talk about their, their defensive systems is they say, these systems are not postured towards Russia and China because they can't, right? They can't be. They, they, they you know, tech, technically speaking, are not capable of shooting down the, the types of missiles that Russia and China have, which is true. But that being said, Russia and China don't don't accept that justification because they look at what a future U.S. missile defense architecture could look like. And they say, you know what, right now, maybe in the in this particular year, you know, th this isn't going to be effective against our our deterrent. But maybe in 10, 20, 30 years, if the U.S. keeps building and, you know, what the, the messages that they hear right when. For example, when President Trump unveiled the, his missile defense review, he said this is designed to shoot down any missile from any target from any country, basically. And so, the, and so, you know, it was very clear that these lines that used to exist where it was like before there was such a it was it was much cleaner where they said, like, this is specifically for, you know, third countries. It's not for Russia and China. Now everything is blurring together. Right. And it makes it a lot harder for the U.S. to go out and say, no, we're not trying to undermine your deterrent Russia. We're not trying to undermine your deterrent China because, you know, you're getting these, these countries are getting these messages that basically say, yeah, we are trying to undermine everyone's deterrent by, by uh, deploying missile defenses at this large of a scale. And for, right? people, so that, that's... For, pe for people who don't get the ABM logic and tell me if I'm correct, the, 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 th the threat of if the United States had a relatively effective ABM system, it and they, it's not that it defends the United States. That's not the threat to Russia, the threat or China. The threat is that the United States could launch a first strike and then so degrade either the Russian or the Chinese capability of, of a retaliatory second strike that the ABM system then would be able to deal with a, a significant amount of that so that the second uh, strike, retaliatory strike, uh, wouldn't have a, as much effect. In, in other words, it would embolden the U.S. to have a first strike. And, and, and in some ways, I think the American military even talks about wanting that. They want an overpowering nuclear presence uh, to intimidate the other side. But what it really does, if I understand it correctly, is it makes the other side say, shit, if we see anything coming, we better preemptively strike. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, I, you know, in, in this sense, I guess it's important to note that, like, the, the U.S. is not, certainly not the only country that is deploying missile defenses at scale, too, right? Like, that, that is the logic of of how, you know, how a defensive system can... Uh, support a first strike posture, but we're seeing you know Russia also make pretty tremendous strides with their missile defenses. China's is also doing the same thing. So it's you know I just I I want to I want to note that like this is something that is happening all across the board, right? That it seems that but, but but triggered because the Americans abrogated the treaty. Perhaps yeah, it's I guess it's interesting to think about like what are the the drivers specifically. Uh, for each individual country, right? Because there are there are so many reasons why countries choose to build up their forces, and a, a lot of it is like mirroring, right? Too. So we're seeing, you know, if if you know, it's it's a, it is a great question, right? Of thinking about what happens if the U.S. does not abrogate the treaty in two thousand and two. Does does all of this happen anyways, or or um, or do we have a much more stable world? And I I, I tend to think the latter. Um, but there also are a lot of other drivers for why these things happen. Well, th there's a recent speech by uh, Jake Sullivan. The, uh, he's the national security advisor, right? Um, where he says in the past, Russia and the United States were able to negotiate uh, nuclear uh, arms limitation treaties, even at times of great stress and so on, yep. even when the world was very dangerous. And he said something which I thought was good because... That hasn't really been the the uh, language coming out of Washington since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. He said, in spite of that, there still could be negotiations, and that yeah. was like, 
you know, at least in language, a good, yeah. a, a good statement. Um, so let's take him at his word for the sake of argument anyway. I don't know if it's just rhetoric at, at this moment, but if it is, it's better rhetoric than previous rhetoric. What, what, what do you think should be the agenda for such talks? Obviously, it has to be U.S., Russia, and China at least, if not the, yeah. all the nuclear-armed uh, uh, countries, but certainly the three major ones. Uh, what yeah. what should they try to do? I mean, is it a new ABM treaty? W what is it? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So, you know, certainly... It's it's difficult, right, with between between Russia and China because there's such different histories there, and and so much, such a different level of experience when it comes to arms control, right? The the U.S. has you know more than 50 years of dealing with with Russia on matters of nuclear weapons, and so as a result, there is this kind of there's a shared language, there's a shared understanding of how you know deterrence works, right? There's a shared understanding of which things are important to put into treaties. And I think the U.S. has a good understanding of what Russia's priorities are, and Russia has a good understanding of what the U.S. priorities are. It's just a matter of trying to make those fit. With China, it's much harder because there is zero history of negotiating with them at all um, on, on matters of nuclear arms. And so it's really complicated, right? Because, you know, the, the Trump administration... I think they their instinct was good, right? When they said, we want to bring, you know, we want to do a negotiation with the US, Russia, and China. I think the way they went about it was, to be frank, pretty sloppy and was probably done not in the in the best of faith um, because, you know, it was done in the context of, of uh, you know, trying to expand New START, which was something that was never going to happen. But the idea of bringing China into negotiations is a, is a good impulse. But the problem with that is that you you have to start from like square one, right? Like very much so. Like we're just thinking about um, even just about like what concepts mean, right? What deterrence means. These things mean very different things in U.S. strategic culture than they do in Chinese strategic culture. And that makes a really big difference because when the U.S. goes and says, Hey, we want to do an arms control treaty um, with China. You know, I, I've seen I've seen some interpretations in which, in in China, even the term arms control can have a very different connotation, and it can mean much more. Um, you know, so, sort of a more. Uh, I, I guess an idea of like the U.S. controlling China's arms rather than like a mutually constructive deal. And so, like even just the lang the language that we use has to be. Um, decided and, and agreed upon way in advance. So I, I think there is, we are, I think, like a decade at least away from a treaty with China because you need these kinds of, you know, even even happening at a non-formal level, right? Like a track two with just civil society or just academics, um, just to sort of understand wh what is it that China wants? You know, are they willing to be transparent about their nuclear forces? Because China is is very opaque about what it plans to do with its with its nuclear arsenal, and so if you want to do a treaty with well, the thing is with China, they they've got an experience, including 1958, uh, where the United States said to China, "If you use conventional forces against Taiwan, we'll we'll use a nuclear bomb against you." And Eisenhower actually okayed it, and the, and there's minutes of a meeting of the Joint Chiefs of Staff discussing using a nuclear bomb against China in 1958. And the only reason it didn't happen, I guess Mao knew, knew of the threat and pulled back and stopped uh, shelling uh, those islands. Like uh, I always screw up the names of these islands right near the Chinese coast, so the Taiwanese islands. Uh, so, I mean, the, the threat of an American first strike in defense of Taiwan has, has been a real thing in history. And and but even then, for decades and decades, the Chinese didn't do this build out to try to get nuclear weapon no. parity that they're doing now. And surely they have people that study the history of these kinds of treaties. Uh, but I, I, I what they've said, like they've said this on climate and I'm guessing they might say the same thing on nuclear arms treaties, which is what how do we expect cooperation a, a, with you and they've said it on climate, like I say, but I'd, if I were yeah. them, I'd say it on nukes. 
one, we don't know who's going to be president in two years. Yeah. And if and if it's someone who wants war with China over Taiwan, and certainly the rhetoric coming out of the Trumpist forces is is is, is even more uh, aggressive than the Biden rhetoric. Although I think the Bi uh, Chinese understand the Biden rhetoric is to do more with domestic politics. Uh, yeah. You know, not don't look weak on China. Like all the big corporate leaders that recently went to uh, China, you know, uh, Larry Fink from BlackRock and Apple was there and Gates from Microsoft was there. And now they send Blinken and Yellen. I mean, I think the Chinese understand that the Democrats more or less are going to leave the status quo with Taiwan, but they don't know what to expect with the Trump administration, and it's the Republicans in the House that established this, you know, committee to go after everything, anything to do with China. Um, so, it, you know, it, the, it, part of the problem is, you alluded to it earlier, is that the Republicans take this big step, and then the next Democratic administration doesn't undo it. So even though Bush yeah. abrogated the treaty in 2002, nothing stopped Obama from... Re, or, you know, re, reinstalling the ABM treaty as he did with the Par, uh, well, Biden did with Paris Accord, but, but yeah. the Democrats essentially, you know, the Republicans take a big Cold Warish step, and then the Dems leave it. Yeah, it's and this is you know this is a big problem, right? Because you know what we're seeing, um, you know, certainly when it comes to when it comes to China, is that these types of academic exchanges that used to happen all the time, right? Where between, um, you know, American academics, Chinese academics, and th these are real opportunities to be able to engage with China and, and understand at least what what it is that is the dominant line of thinking when it comes to nuclear weapons. Um, but a lot of those things have been restricted now, right? Like you can't do the, uh, many of those types of academic exchanges anymore. You know, that that restricts our ability to understand and to prepare for a potential new treaty. Um, and yeah, it's, 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 you know, it can be quite frustrating. Well, the Chinese have said on the climate thing when Kerry went, you know, it's great you're here. And yes, we should be talking about climate. But how do we take you seriously when you're still right. restricting, you know, you're waging chip wars against us and yeah. you're, you're even sanctioning technology to create better batteries for solar power, which essentially would help in dealing with the cr climate crisis. So, yeah. you know, I, I think the onus really is on the U.S. to take more seriously the risk of nuclear war and climate crisis. And have to make some steps to make it look like negotiations are for real. And, and like I say, Sullivan's words about the negotiations are good, but it's not enough if you don't take some concrete steps in the in, in, uh, certainly on the Chinese side uh, to to drop some of these sanctions. Yeah, it, well, it's 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 really difficult. And you know, the point you made about not knowing, you know, who who is going to be the president in in a couple of years, um, and having a potential you know, tremendous reversal in policy um, or, you know, uh, I guess accelerating what would otherwise be a destabilizing policy. Um, that's that's really serious. Right. We, and, you know, it, especially it comes into play with Iran. Right. It comes to play with Russia. You know, I think what we've seen is that many countries don't view the United States as a as a particularly stable negotiating partner anymore. Um, but this is a this is a huge problem, right? Because the U.S. needs to be a, a a leader on arms control and disarmament, and it's it's really difficult to do that when you could have all that progress undone um, in in a matter of a uh, you know four years. And you, in terms of Russia, people that watch the analysis know I've denounced the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you know, hundreds of times. That said, I've also said, and many of my guests have said. Uh, there needs to be a negotiated settlement, and you can't underestimate uh, the danger of nuclear war. And, and the and the U.S. position seems to uh, ignore that risk. And 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 I don't know how serious the risk is of a deliberate use of a tactical nuclear weapon by the Russians. Uh, there's some serious some serious people at, in the foreign policy circles in Russia that have talked about using a tactical nuclear weapon against Poland as a shot across the bow of NATO, 
I, I don't know how seriously one should take that. But but the danger of miscalculation that Russian, uh, that uh, not Russian, the uh, missile that did land in Poland, it turned out to be Ukrainian. Um, what happens sometime when one of those go astray and land somewhere near Moscow uh, uh, in, in, in such a situation? But I don't get that the, that there's a serious consideration of the of the risk of accidental nuclear war as a result of Ukraine. Yeah, I you know I I certainly I think this is the case um, in a number of hotspots across the globe too. Right, you you mentioned the the case in Ukraine. We saw I think it was just it was just last year or no so uh, yeah last year um, uh, India accidentally launched a missile into Pakistani territory, right? This is the first time in, in decades that a nuclear-armed country uh, accidentally launched a missile into another nuclear-armed country's territory, right? So it's, you know, the, there are a lot of um, ve like very serious incidents like these, right? You mentioned the, the one in, in Ukraine and Poland, um, you know, the one in India. But these kinds of incidents happen more often than people think. And the danger here is that you know, I think many folks in the, you know, in, I guess, um, who work in this field and think about deterrence a lot, I think perhaps consider that perhaps uh, escalation can be controlled a little bit better than it can be in, in real life, right? And and we have no idea what happens when a weapon goes off, right? We, we don't have a realistic, you know, way of, of, uh, of estimating what what will happen, right? In terms of how the conflict will will change, right? So we can war game things all the time and and imagine what might happen if a if a weapon accidentally goes off in a particular context, but we have no idea, right? It's going to be a, a very degraded information environment. Decision making is going to be really confusing. You know, people will be trying to attribute what happened, and there's going to be misinformation and conspiracy theories and all these things. Right. It's it's going to be a an incredibly muddy situation. And I think presuming that we are able to control the the after effects of a nuclear detonation um, is dangerous. Right. And it, it leads to very risky and I think perhaps overconfident thinking. And, and you know, I, I certainly think you're right that I think that, you know, probably in every country, not not, you know, not just the United States. I would imagine this is certainly the case in Russia and China, India, Pakistan, North Korea. That that there is this presumption that we can control escalation and we can control how a nuclear war is going to play out, and I am I certainly wouldn't want to gamble on that, and and um I I don't I don't think that that's particularly realistic. It's nuts. Yes, I mean Ellsberg called it institutional madness. It's it's instant institutional madness fueled by money making. Uh, just finally, you're in D.C. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how much you, but a lot of people working on these issues interact with congressional staff and members of Congress. It's like this topic is practically taboo. I mean, nobody talks about it. Yeah, so the number of people in Congress who I would say really pay a very close attention to nuclear issues is very small, right? Um you know, perhaps like a, a dozen really dedicated folks who who really think about these things a lot. Um, this is not nearly enough, right? Certainly, you know, during the Cold War, even immediately after the Cold War, um, Congress took its role in in foreign policy, but really in in nuclear policy, very seriously, right? You, you would have these teams of Congress people who would travel to Russia to supervise and, and um, you know, advise on negotiations, right? They participated in New START negotiations, right, in, in, uh, in you know, 2010, right? So this is something that you, you don't see anymore, right? Yeah, I, I can't imagine another congressional, um, like a, a real serious congressional engagement on arms control um, because the... It, you know, I guess for many reasons, right? Congress in general, I think, is very much not particularly interested in exercising foreign policy power anymore. Um, but also, there, there was some initiative by was it Markey and a couple of others, but it didn't seem to go very far. 
Yeah. So, you know, there there are a few, you know, I mentioned there's a few Congress people who are who are really interested in, and Ed Markey is certainly one of them, right? They, they have a really dedicated um, nuclear team there and they're they're focused on um, issues like no first use and trying to reduce the number of weapons in the U.S. arsenal, promote arms control, things like that. I agree in these really productive steps, but they are very much, you know, operating, uh, you know, with very few allies in Congress. And it's difficult, right? Like this is the job of, of many folks in D.C. to try and go to the Hill and, and educate and explain a little bit more about why these issues are so important. You know, why um, we should be engaging in arms control, reaching across the aisle to try and make arms control a little bit more, um, I guess, less politicized and a little more domestically palatable again. Um, but it's it's really difficult because it's so, you know, just like every other issue now, it's it's very much uh, it has kind of a bad taste to it, especially following the invasion of Ukraine, because no one wants to be seen engaging with Russia anymore, which, you know, I can understand at least, you know, very much on an emotional level because of what's going on in Ukraine. At the same time, you know, these are exactly the moments when it's really important to be engaging on arms control because, you know, you're, you're just unfortunately, by the way of how the world works, you have to deal with all of these other very intense and serious nuclear powers um, because the alternative is is so much worse. All right. Thanks very much for joining us, Matt. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news. Please don't forget, uh, there's a donate button at the top of the website. If you're on YouTube, hit subscribe. If you're on all the podcast platforms, uh, come on over to the website, check it out, hit the donate button, and thanks for joining us.